Good morning, everybody. And if you're very nervous about the first aid, <coughs> I should tell you I'm also a qualified first aider. So uh, we're well, well looked after. Um, when I was first thinking about what I might want to tell you uh, this morning, I had a chat with Stuart Munro, um, a very good colleague and friend. And Stuart said to me, um, you can talk about anything, just don't talk about the science of climate change. So I thought, okay then. So I was trying to think about this whole idea of connectivity around people with a common interest, the common interest being climate change, but that we're not necessarily thinking about the science of climate change. Uh, we're thinking about how we might work together to be able to deliver something which has huge impact for us here in Scotland but also wider impact. So, as you know, science and an awful lot of what we do is international. So what we do here can have a huge impact on others. And the first thing that I was considering is that we're in a very fortunate position in Scotland. Um, many of you know about our stunning record in terms of research achievement, uh, we're number one in the world for research impact against our GDP. That's quite something. So we're way ahead of the rest of the UK, uh, France, Germany, uh, Japan, US. So research impact here is phenomenal. We also organise ourselves slightly differently. And I'll give you a good example and a bad example. So a good example is that we work together in a collegiate way when often people are quite competitive in the area of scientific research. And we now have well-established and successful research pools in Scotland, which bring together people working in environmental science, in life science, in physics, informatics, imaging, a whole number of different areas. And this is important because what it's allowed us to do as a very small nation, only five million people, it's allowed us to have huge international clout in key subject areas. So it may surprise you to know that Scotland is number one in the world in space science. Okay, so how many knew that before you came here today? We're number one in the world in agricultural science. Anybody know that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're number one in the world in uh, pharmacology. Okay, so that's amazing that we are number one in the world in these areas and we have done it largely by deciding how can we put together an absolutely compelling case to be able to attract the best in the world to, to come and work here with us. Because the raison d'etre for most scientists and engineers is not actually where you're working, uh, the physical environment, it's who you're working with. That's what matters. And if all of you examine your everyday working life and think, what made that a good day? Or what made that a bad day? Is it not to do with the people? Um, it certainly is for me. The most exciting research aspects of my life are to do with who I was working with and how that stimulated really innovative thinking around my own research. Because if I'm honest, um, I can come up with ideas if you lock me in a darkened room and you give me a bottle of something nice, I'll come up with lots of good ideas. But if it's just me in the room with the bottle, nobody's challenging me. Nobody's um, saying, yeah, but what if? Or I'm not sure that's a very good idea, or nobody's refining my thinking. And if somebody comes back and challenges me, then that's going to make me much more innovative. So very early on in my research career, I realised that my success was going to be in large part due to the partnerships and networks that I was involved with. And, and actually that's been the case. And it's been an evolution generally in science. I know if you look back, let's say go back to the 1930s, also an interesting time in science, but you look at authorship of papers then. You tended to get individual people working on their own. If you look nowadays at papers uh, in my own area in life sciences, 
then the average would be three or four people on a paper. If you go to particle physics, then the average is probably three or four hundred people on a paper for particular areas of science where it's a real collaboration. But our science is becoming much more multidisciplinary and therefore we have a lot of opportunity to think about not just the usual suspects of who we work with, but who can we work with who's different. And I like the introductory remarks about, um, okay, I've done my job, I've spoken to at least someone I didn't know. And there's actually quite a few faces here that I don't know and hopefully we'll be able to speak to um, in the breakout sessions over coffee. But one of the things that we had done in uh, the Natural Environment Research Council was where we were trying to think of getting interdisciplinary approach to problems, one of those problems being climate change. We wondered about how you encourage people to work together who have not already done so. And for most of us, um, certainly for me in my working life, money is a big incentive. And it's not the amount I'm paid that's the incentive, it's the amount that I can persuade someone else to give me to do what I find really interesting. So grant funding is a tremendous carrot. So how can you use that imaginatively to get people to work together who have not already done so? Well, that one's quite easy. What you can do is you can say, I've got a pot of money. It's for a climate change initiative. Um, you are eligible for that pot of money if you can demonstrate that the partnership you're putting together to be able to address a particular question um, is with people that you have never worked with before. <coughs> and we, in NERC, set up a series of grants based exactly around that. And in fact, I've done the, own th the same thing in my own office uh, in Scottish Government, which deals with public engagement because we at one point felt it was the same suspects coming along asking for public engagement money on science and uh, we really wanted different approaches so we said well we're not going to give you the money if you come along with, on your own or with someone you've already worked with but if you come along with someone you haven't worked with then you're eligible and we'll look at it and that did spark off a lot of really interesting examples um, so again, it emphasises in my mind the value of working with different people. Now there is a challenge in that, and that is that uh, it's my view, and maybe, maybe it's just about me here, but um, I think humans are fundamentally lazy, so uh, you heard it here, self-confession. I will tend to do things that are easier and not harder particularly when you're just trying to get stuff done in your everyday life. And that sometimes means speaking to someone you already know with the background that fits yours, who is very like you and has the same objectives as you, because that's an easy sell. And what's difficult is, for example, to me to go into a room and speak to people, financiers, who I might not usually speak to. And actually, let, let me give you a, a small example of this. Um, very early on, when I was seconded to Scottish Government as Chief Scientific Advisor, you find yourself in a position where you're asked to huge numbers of events um, to celebrate or mark things or a gathering of people. And I was invited to an event in Edinburgh which was about investment, venture capital and angel funding investment for science and engineering. And it was one of those things where I was kind of dreading the informal part of the evening because I knew I was going to go in there and not know anyone in the room. And sure enough, there was more there than there are of you here. And I went into the room desperately searching around for some friendly face or someone I could go over to and then plan my attack. But um, no, there wasn't a single friendly face. So I was kind of standing there like a, a bit of a lemon. 